Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we're going to go over introduction to big O notation. So this comes up, I think, a lot, mostly during software engineering interviews or data science interviews. But it is a very important concept in general that you should always be thinking about when you're trying to design how do I solve this problem. So instead of going over anything theoretical with you, I'm just going to go over a real example. So you can even think of this as practice for your coding interview if you want. This is a real question I've received in the past. And I'm going to walk you through how to solve it three different ways, each one being better than the last. And we'll try to quantify this betterness. And the way we quantify it is big O notation. Okay, so let's get started. The problem is that you have a list of numbers from 1 to n. So you have every number from 1 to n in a list, and it's sorted. Now, someone removes one of these numbers, and you don't know which one they remove. And you need to write a piece of code to figure out which is the missing number. So setup is pretty simple. So just to be very explicit here, let's say that n was equal to 10. So we have just 10 numbers. So we have this list given to us. We need to figure out in some kind of programmatic way that 3 is the missing number from this list. So now let's go over three different ways to do it. And each one will be improving on the last in some way. And we're going to be, again, quantifying this improvement using big O notation. I think the most naive or most trivial way people might solve this is try number one. So it's very, very simple. The entire algorithm or pseudocode fits inside these two lines. We know that the numbers go between 1 and n. So let's just say that for every number between 1 and n, I'm going to go check if it's in the list. And once I find the number that's not in the list, that is the missing number. So I think that's pretty obvious, pretty straightforward. But let's think about the efficiency. And now by efficiency, I mean as the size of the list gets bigger. So in this example, we just had a small list of size 10. And this method on this list probably wouldn't take too long. But big O notation operates under the very realistic and very practical assumption that although the number of things that we're dealing with right now might be relatively small, we need to make sure that whatever code we're writing is going to scale, which means that as the number of things gets bigger, gets doubles or quadruples or times 10, the amount of time that our code is taking is not going to be going up by too much. So let's see why it's going to be a problem in this case. So let's say that we have 1 through n and we do this process, which is just for each of those numbers, we check if it's in the list or not. Let's see on average how long this is going to take, how many operations it's going to require. And the number of operations is a proxy for how much time the entire piece of code is going to take. So how many operations are required? First, we check the number 1. And we are keeping in mind this list is sorted, so we don't need to check the entire list for whether 1 is in there. We just need to check the first element. So we're going to need one operation to check whether or not the number 1 is in there. Assuming it is, now we need to check the number 2. That's going to require two operations. We'll go ahead and check the first element and then the second element and make sure that 2 is at the second position. That's going to require two checks and so on. 3, 4, 5, and on average, given that the number that's taken out is random, we're going to need to go up to n over 2, which is half the size of our list. So this is just an average, right? So we're going to say that the number of operations we need in order to execute this piece of code on average is going to be 1 plus 2 plus 3 all the way to plus n over 2. So we're checking if 1 is in the list, if 2 is in the list, if 3 is in the list, all the way to on average if n over 2 is in the list. Sometimes it'll take shorter than this, sometimes it's longer. Again, this is just an on average performance analysis. So this is a pretty easy sum to compute. We can just use the Gaussian sum formula. So if you're not familiar with that, I'll link the description below, but you've probably seen this before. This is going to be given by this equation. And if we simplify all the terms, we get that the number of operations that are needed on average for a list of size n is n squared over 8 plus n over 4. Great. Now what do we do with that? Now here's where big O notation comes in. Big O notation says that although there's a couple of terms going on here, there's some stuff being divided, I don't care about anything except the dominant term. And by dominant term, we mean looking at these two terms, n squared over 8 or n over 4. Which one is going to be biggest as n gets larger and larger and larger? Which one's going to take over? As we know, a quadratic function like n squared grows at a much faster rate than a linear function like n. So the dominant term, or the one that's going to be taking over in the long run as n gets larger and larger, is going to be n squared. Okay, And for that reason, we say that the time complexity of this method is big O of n squared. And the way you write that is literally just a big O. And in the parentheses, you put n squared. And a quick thing to note, we don't even care about any of these uh, coefficients here. We don't care if it's a 1 fourth or 1 eighth. Big O notation is only concerned 
with the overall characteristic growth. It doesn't matter the exact coefficient. The only thing that matters is that as the number of elements doubles or quadruples, what's happening to the amount of operations that's required. And based on this formula, we see that if our number of elements doubles, let's say we are dealing with a million elements and now we're dealing with two million elements because n squared is the dominant term, actually a doubling in the size of our list is going to cause a times four or quadrupling of the amount of operations it's going to take. And this is generally bad news. This is generally a case we would like to avoid or improve if possible. So let's go to try number two, a different way to solve this problem, which is going to be more efficient, which is going to have a big O that is better. So try number two is a little bit more clever. It says that I know that the original list contained every number from one to n, and that had a fixed sum. So if I summed all of those numbers between one and n, I can again use the Gaussian sum formula to get this as the sum of all of the numbers from one to n. Now I know you took just one number out, so all I really need to do is go sum up the existing numbers in the list, all the other numbers, which I'm going to call s, and then if I simply just subtract s from the sum of all of the numbers, I'm going to get back exactly the missing number. So pretty genius solution if you ask me. Now let's do the same kind of analysis. How many operations is this going to take for a list that is size n? So we can pretty much just look at it. We can say that, okay, there's this thing we need to compute. And notice that this is just a fixed calculation. So if n is 1 million or if it's 2 million, that's not going to change the number of operations it takes to compute that formula. That formula is just one addition, one multiplication, and one division. So that's three operations here. Now the biggest bulk of time is coming from the second step, which is summing up all the numbers that are in the list that I'm given. If you're summing up a list of n numbers, you're going to have to do roughly n additions, right? Because each number is going to get added to the number next to it, or you're going to accumulate some kind of sum, so it's going to be about n additions. So that's where this n comes in. And this final one here is coming from just the subtraction. So the last operation we do is a subtraction. So the number of operations required is n plus 4 for a list of size n. And now if you look at n and you look at 4, which is the dominant term, this is even easier to identify than case number 1, because 4 is obviously just fixed, and n is the one that's growing over time. So we see that this is big O of n. And this is much better than big O of n squared. Because what this means is that if the number of elements doubles, again, if we go from 1 million to 2 million elements, we're not going to be quadrupling the amount of operations or amount of time that's required. We are just going to be doubling the number of operations. So this is growing at a much more favorable rate. If we're talking about a real world example here, let's say that you're a startup and maybe you just have like 100 clients right now. Obviously, you want your company to do well and you want to have a million clients in the future, but that can only work out if the systems you've built are able to scale properly. And this is scaling much more properly or much more preferably than the first one we looked at. And before we go to the last example and the best one, I do want to note a couple of things. Some of you might be kind of skeptical about the number of operations that I calculated. For example, maybe you're saying that if I'm adding up n elements, it's just going to be n minus 1 additions, not n additions. Or maybe you think that if I'm doing this multiplication, it required one more or one less operation than I thought. But it doesn't matter, and that's the beauty of big O notation, which is that even if you shift this 3 to a 4 or a 5, if you shift this 1 to a 2 or a 3, the final result is still going to be that this thing is big O of n. So that's kind of a double-edged sword of big O notation, which is that the math we're doing in big O notation is kind of fuzzy, so it takes a little bit of time to get used to, but it also means that you can make a little bit of mistakes in the constant terms. Even if I put a coefficient of like 10 on this n by accident for some reason, the final result is still going to be big O of n. The big O notation is only concerned with the overall growth characteristic of your algorithm, not the exact nitty gritty of the numbers themselves. Because once you get to big, very big numbers, you're only concerned with how is it growing, not what is the exact number at that point. So let's close this video by looking at the most clever solution. And this, again, takes into account the fact that the list is sorted, but uses that in a much more powerful way. So here's what we're going to do, and I want to uh, demonstrate this on a small list because it can be a little bit tricky to understand. So let's say that I have this list, so all the numbers from 1 to 10, and you can pretty easily see the missing element is 1. What I'm going to do is something very interesting. I'm going to say, let's go find the middle element of this list. And if you stare at this for a second, you'll find that the middle element is this number 6, right? So there's four elements on the left and four elements on the right. Now, what would the average of this list be if I had not taken anything out? The average would be 5.5. So you can confirm that 
Now the fact that 6, which is the middle element of my new list here, is bigger than 5.5 tells me that the missing element must come from the left hand side. And mathematically this is because when you take away a smaller element, the average, or in this case technically I think we're talking about medians here, the median will go up. Therefore the element that's missing must come from the left hand side of the list. So now I know a very powerful thing, which means that I can just throw away the entire half of the list that comes afterward because I know the missing element cannot be there. So I'm only now analyzing stuff that's on the left hand side. So I basically cut my work in half and that's where the power of this method comes from. But before we do our analysis, let's just make sure we understand it by looking at the other case. So here's another list I could be given. So if you notice the missing element here is seven, which is in the second half of the list. So if we compute the median of this list, that's going to be the number five. And how does five compare to the median of the entire list without anything taken out? Again, that median is equal to 5.5. Since five in this new list is smaller than the median of 5.5, I know that the missing element must come from the right-hand side of the list because when you take away a bigger number, the median should go down, right? So that means that I can throw away the entire first part of the list because the missing number cannot be there and I'm only going to focus my attention now on, on the second half of the list. So in both of these cases, I was able to do a very powerful thing. I was able to cut my work in half instantly. And you might see where this is going. You can just keep doing this. Now for whichever part of the list I'm looking at, I can just perform this analysis again. Take the median, see how it compares to what the median should be, cut the list in half, cut the list in half over and over and over again. Now the analysis of this is slightly more involved and I'll walk you through it right now but you'll see that it's not too bad once you've done a couple of examples. So the question is, of course, for a list of size n, how many operations are required? So ops of n is how many operations needed for a list of size n. Now let's solve this in kind of a recurrence way. And we can say that first two operations are required. The first thing I need to do is compute the expected median of the whole list, which was 5.5. And this happens in constant time, which means that it doesn't matter how big the list is, I can just compute the median instantaneously. And the reason for that is the same reason that I can compute a formula like this instantaneously. So that's just one operation. So that's one operation. And the other operation I need to do is get the actual median of the list that I am given. And that also can happen in a fixed amount of time. The reason is that when you have a list and you want to access a given element of the list, it doesn't matter how big the list is, you can access that element in a constant amount of time. And I know that's not trivial. Um, and if you haven't studied computer science before, that might seem like a magical or skeptical claim. But just know that if you have a list and it's million elements or two million or five million, and you want to get the tenth element of each of these lists, it's not going to take any longer for the bigger list than the smaller list. So that's why I only need two operations. The first is to compute the expected median, and the second is to get the actual median of this list. So that's two plus however long it takes me, however many operations I need on half of the list. So the story that's being told here again is that the number of operations I need to finish this problem on a list of size n is two operations plus however many operations it takes on a list of size n over two. So we can just continue this recurrence. I can take this, split it up in the same way, and I get that the number of operations is equal to four plus the number of operations on a list of size n over four. So I can just keep going, splitting the list in half, in half, in half, in half, k time. And after I've split it in half k times, the number of operations it's going to take is 2k plus the number of operations on a list of size n divided by 2 to the power of k. Now I think it is helpful if you have a piece of paper with you while you're watching this video and confirm this for yourself. So if you need to do that, go ahead and pause or rewind and take care of that. Now if we put k is equal to log 2 of n, we're going to take this all the way to the end and we're going to finally get the result. The number of operations required to complete this process on a list of size n is 2 log 2 of n plus the number of operations needed to do this problem on a list of size 1. And that's just going to be one operation, right? That's just going to be a trivial case. So in the end, we get that this whole thing is given by this formula. And again, ask yourself, what's the dominant term in this formula? Of course, it's not this guy because that's just a constant. So it's going to be log two of n. And that's why we say that this try, this final trial we're doing is big O of log n. And this is much better again than the one we did just before. Because if you go back to your algebra class, you'll remember that a function that grows linearly is actually much faster growing than a function that grows 
logarithmically. So remember, a linear function is like this, but a log function is kind of like this. So even if we double the number of elements in the list, the amount of operations actually will less than double, which is pretty good case scenario, especially compared to the very first one we did, where doubling the number of elements quadruples the number of operations required. So this is where we want to be. And notice it took me a while to explain this to you, but once you kind of are comfortable with these operations, it'll be more second nature. And I do want to show you in code, uh, make sure that everything I said is kind of true. So here's a graph of looking at what happens to the time required to solve this problem as n goes up. So you'll see the three different graphs and you can see the story told very clearly. You can see in the red graph, that's obviously not where you want to be. The time grows up so fast. The blue graph is doing okay, but definitely you want to be in the green graph because the way that's going, it's going to be the best time efficiency you can get. Again, uh, the point I want to get across is not this exact problem or any of the exact numbers we were looking at, but while doing big O math can seem kind of fuzzy and counterintuitive and going against all the algebraic rules that you've thought about, I think it helps if in the back of your mind you keep this idea that big O notation is only concerned with what happens to the number of operations that are required as the size of your problem doubles or triples or quadruples or so on. Because big O notation is concerned with the fact that maybe whatever you're dealing with right now could be small, whether that's customers or data in your machine learning algorithm or whatever. But we want to make sure that whatever system you're building is able to scale, is able to grow at a sustainable rate when that number gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And that number hopefully does get bigger because that means that your company or your project is doing well, okay? So if you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments below. I think there's more to be said about big O notation, of course. So if you have any specific ones, let me know. Um, if you like this video, please like and subscribe, and I will see you next time.